My, my presentation is uh, all about flash and trash, <coughs> which is something that I usually talk about in, with, in, on my blog and on and, uh, and our writings. <coughs> Please, guys. So um, who am I? I am an independent analyst here with more than 20 years of experience. 20 years is something that I started to write more than five years ago, so probably it's 25, I could write 25. I started with Assembler. I founded Tech Unplugged, actually is a, yeah, it's a joint effort. It's not just me. Uh, most of the, of the content is produced by others, but actually I'm trying to, to put all the dots together and make the picture working. Uh, and I'm a, an amateur boat builder, so I built my boat, last one. And I also weekend sailor and angler. And uh, you can find me on juku.it or uh, on Twitter. And uh, Chris told me that uh, it's important to say that the other one is the fish. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, we always talk about flash. Yes, flash is the topic of the day. If you are not doing flash, we are. You are not fancy, so really. But the reality is that we are piling up a lot of trash every day. Any kind of data that we are producing today, not all of that is accessed all the time. Not all of that has, needs to be uh, accessed really fast. And so we have different uh, uh, approaches to data. We, we need to have different approaches. In the past, it was just the storage. So especially in the mid-sized companies, it was just unified storage. Please go unified. It's a storage for everything. It's changing. So these kind of storages are doing too many things at the same time, and they are not efficient. They are not efficient for many, many reasons. So someone tried to make them more efficient. Okay. So they added to mechanical disks, some flash, they tried. It didn't work very well, especially at the beginning. Now the second generation of hybrid system did it better, but actually there are some problems of predictability when you are in the very high end of your workloads. When, when you need to have the very fixed latency, you want to be sure that any transaction is made in a hundred millisecond. Sometimes if you hit the the mechanical disk, it doesn't happen. And of course, you need something more. You, data growth, performance uh, need to be uh, better, and so on. So what's really happening? They're happening is uh, that needs are diverging. There, we have uh, two kinds of needs, actually. And uh, if the clicker works, OK. So we have. On one side, we need more IOPS. We need less latency. We need more predictability. We need everything fast, just straight and fast. On the other side, we need more capacity, much more capacity, okay, and less costs. In fact, if we if we if the clicker works, so we measure dollar for gigabyte for the primary storage. The target is $1 per gigabyte today. But in the secondary storage, we are targeting cent for gigabyte. I'm not just talking about Amazon, talking about one cent for gigabyte. I'm talking about the object storage that you can buy uh, in your on premises. Okay, we are targeting this kind of prices, which are 10 times lower, uh, 100 times lower, sorry. And it's the way we manage storage. Primary storage is usually managers in terabytes. It could be also hundreds of terabytes per sysadmin, but not that many. You have many LANs, you have many uh, virtual machines probably, but you manage it on a, on a terabyte basis. On the object storage, on the scale-out storage part, you need petabyte for sysadmins because you need to manage 
many more petabytes to, man to, to have it cost down. And again, with the flash storage, with the primary storage, you need local performance. You need the performance right to the server. You need to serve a bunch of machines that are local. We are in the data center, potentially in two data centers, in the building of your company. For files, you need distributed storage. You need a distributed performance. You need something that can be accessed from anywhere in the world, from your laptop, from your uh, mobile computer, for your, from your phone. Okay. So the kind of performance here is developed in a very short distance. Here is very long distance. So probably you will have to manage performance from, with caches, with, uh, with uh, content distribution networks with, in a total different way. You use FC, iSCSI here. You use API. You use TCP IP, generic TCP IP here. So it's not the same kind of protocol. It's not the same predictability. You can drop a, a packet with a TCP IP. You can drop a packet on the FC. I hate this clicker. <laughs> and uh, of course, on primary storage, you do database transactions. You do something that you need to, to be sure that it works all the time. It's not, again, a lot of data, but it's very important data to you. On the other side, you probably store on the scale-out storage, on the huge repositories that I'm thinking about, everything else. So all the data streams. I have customer, uh, so I was with a customer on Monday, and he told me, we are trying to collect all our logs. Uh, just we are starting now, only 30% of our data center have all the logs collected in the same place. We are already, uh, piling up 25 gigabytes a day. And this is just the beginning. 20 gigabytes a day, it's a lot. You can't manage it on a traditional storage. So the problem is today, flash versus disk. Yes, I have this slide. Uh, I, I did this l very little research on uh, March 2015. I got uh, uh, HGST price because just because I have a friend in HGST and he gave me all the prices, so not, not because one vendor is better than the other. And uh, I got a uh, two inches drive SAS, nine, 900 gigabytes, a SAS uh, uh, drive with SSDs, uh, six terabyte SATA drive, and four terabyte consumer SATA drive. Okay, and they, why I'm doing that? Because this is our enterprise drives, but actually this one uses MLC. And you know that most of the vendors today are saying we are using consumer grade MLC. In fact, consumer grade MLC doesn't exist. MLC is MLC. Someone invented enterprise, in EML, enterprise MLC, sorry. So for a marketing reason, we, now we have consumer MLC, but originally it was MLC, okay. The problem is that uh, uh, if we, we are going to look at the prices, of course, this is the least prices. You can just, if you are going to buy the stuff, probably you will get 50% of discount or more. And it's six months whole data. And the prices are going down for everyone. I looked at it yesterday on Amazon to check. This drive now costs six terabyte, 150, okay? So, yeah, you can say prices here are going down very quickly, also here, okay? And the only difference between these drives and this is my friend is in the enterprise group, so he gave me all the enterprise prices, and I got this price on Amazon. And it's, I can assume that uh, uh, if you buy the, the disk, uh, not on Amazon, but in, in bulk, probably, this is not cost 150 because you receive the, the disk with the, all the box, all the, all the stuff that you can receive. So it's, it's a, I can assume that it costs less if you, if you buy many of them. Why I'm saying that? But why I'm uh, adding the consumer drive? Because 
many vendors in the scale out storage in the very high capacity system are using these drives now. Okay, and I will explain later. So today we have this. This is the, uh, the most expensive drive, yes. And this is the cheapest drive, that's easy to find. Also, you will find that this is very costly per gigabyte, okay? But at, at the same time, you have the, this one is very, very, very cheap from the gigabyte, dollar per gigabyte uh, standpoint. At the same time, dollar per IOPS is quite different. So it's very cheap. If you measure the number of IOPS that that disk does and how much uh, the IOPS cost, it's very, very, very uh, cheap. On the contrary, a six terabyte drive is very costly from the IOPS point of view, okay? So, and if you look, the difference between the SATA drive and the consumer drive is not that uh, much. So if we are going to measure IOPS per gigabyte, we will see that we, we do a huge amount of IOPS for each single gigabyte. And really, I never see this number from any vendor. Yeah, IO density is an important factor. People IO density from primary data is one of the most important things. I don't know why we don't never talk about that. But actually, the fact that you have a disk that can store a database, and you know if you have a one terabyte database, you get uh, C, uh, whatever it's the calculation, but uh, you get that number of IOPS for that density, okay? That's important to me. And, uh, and again, the SATA drives are really, really uh, inconvenient from this point of view. If you look, when, when we say the disk is dead, yes, it's dead. If you look at the SAS drive, 10K drive, it's dead. Is close to the worst number in each column. If, if it is not the worst, it's close to the worst. So even, even in the number of dollar for IOPS, you have 230 against 187 of the SATA. So it's close to the performance of SATA, and we know that, but it doesn't have the performance, the IOPS for gigabyte, of a, uh, of a SAS, or it doesn't have the dollars for IOPS of the, of the SSD. This is the, the difference. This is today, and I want you to look at this. Today we are three dollars for gigabyte. It could be lower, of course, but we have three cents for gigabyte here. 100 times different, two orders of magnitude, okay? It will take time before flash will rule the world, okay? <coughs> but again, it will happen. Eventually, all the system probably will be flash. There are, now we have a 3 d NAND. Tomorrow we, are, we will have TLC, 3, uh, 3D TLC, uh, QLC, uh, 3D or whatever. For, uh, so they are the chip are getting denser and denser. The technology is in evolving very quickly. Uh, big uh, chip manufacturers are investing a lot of money. Today is a problem because these, uh, these fabs are not, uh, uh, are not producing enough. So the price is high because the demand, the demand is very high. But in time, okay, the, the difference between disk and, between, uh, between disk and flash will shrink. Okay. So in time, hybrid, hybrid the, the fact that we have disks and uh, flash on the same system will become all flash hybrid. Two different kinds of flash probably on the same system. Or um, memory store or PCM or whatever as a first tier. So something faster than the, than the current NAND on the first tier. And the second tier will be flash. So again, architecture are diverging too. It's not just about the technology behind them. We have scale up versus scale out. If you look at, uh, at the primary storage system, still today, most of them are still scale up. Okay, 
There are so many talking about uh, uh, primary storage, scale-out primary storage, but actually if you look at, at uh, all the offering from all the vendors, you can count very few of them proposing scale-out storage today and primary storage because it's complicated. Okay, It's a complicated thing. There are a lot of gears moving all around. Uh, so doing the two controller stuff, it's easy. And actually, two controller stuff for a full flash system covers 90% of, of the workload for any kind of company. Okay, You don't have a single loon distributed on 40 nodes. You don't have it. Probably you have many LANs. It's easier to manage uh, a scale out uh, system if you, if you need to manage many, many, many LANs probably. But it's, there are federation now. You can move LANs uh, between uh, scale up arrays. It's not complicated. It's, it's simple to manage that kind of stuff. It's becoming simple. There are uh, tools from uh, the upper layers like VMware as storage of motion, for example, so it's not difficult. Scale-out is another thing, and uh, most of the scale-out system are eventually consistent, for example. So it's, uh, it's not for primary data, okay? But uh, we are getting there. Another thing that is happening is that the storage systems analytics, so for, uh, for uh, most of the primary storage, the important stuff is uh, having uh, analytics for the storage system itself, how it is working, the latency, how uh, the, pa the IO part is developed, how, uh, how that is written, the, the block that you have, the, how do you manage the, the snapshot, and so on. Uh, predict failures, all that kind of stuff. In the, in the very large systems, it's more about data. So you want to know what, dat what data is doing, what people is doing with the data, what, uh, what is happening to data, okay? What is cold, what is hot. Uh, you want to know if you can move things around. Sometimes it's very difficult because you don't know if people is really accessing that data. So there, there are a trend in the industry to add this kind of functionalities. So they are adding metadata to data to understand what is happening to the data stored in the system, more than in the system itself. And of course, it's very difficult how, they, uh, how this system uh, manage data. So you, you have an efficiency in, uh, for the data footprint in a primary system, like for example, compression and the duplication, of course because you need to drive down the, the cost, okay? But also, uh, compression and duplication enables to do better snapshot, enables to do a lot of uh, fancy things with copies of data and so on and so forth. So it's very good to add data footprint efficiency on the primary storage. On the other side, it's all about data protection efficiency on the large system. You don't need compression and the duplication on a large system because probably you are storing files, probably you are storing big files. Most of, the, of these files are encrypted or compressed. Okay, if you are storing a JPEG file, do you want to compress again a JPEG file? No, okay. But you have other uh, techniques like, for example, erasure coding, okay? You don't make many copies, you don't uh, use uh, write six or write five, but you use a register coding. So many more uh, register coding. I think uh, all of you knows a register coding is just uh, a much better data protection, protection mechanism. Uh, you apply a math function to the data and you get many uh, chunks, okay? For example, you get uh, uh, you have 20, you need only 20 chunks out of, let's say, 26 to to get the data back. And uh, if you lose the, you can lose six. So it's like having a RAID six, a RAID with six parities. Okay, you can lose six chunks before 
And of course, if you have many disks, all around, thousands of disks probably, the, the, it's quite difficult to lose six disks all at a, uh, in a single time. So this is the advantage, okay. And of course, again, the provisioning is different. So you provision on primary storage very carefully everything because it costs a lot, because it has to be managed, because someone has to ask you something. On, this, on the other side, also because the kind of services that you implement on this kind of storages is always, it's usually self-provisioned. If you go to, the, uh, to build a sync and share system for your users, you don't want to, to, to give them one gigabyte at a time. You give them probably a portal and they will uh, configure the system. They will ask, okay, I need uh, one terabyte, I can need 20 terabyte, who cares? It's so cheap that it's easier to let them store everything. So there are risks in, in, uh, in going in, uh, towards this direction. So the, the risk is splitting your, your uh, infrastructure in a real hybrid infrastructure with, uh, with two tiers of storage has some risk. Sometimes it's, uh, it pays back. So last week I was with a service provider they are uh, thinking about adopting uh, uh, for the first time object storage, okay? For example, there's a way to do very large repositories of storage. They, uh, we went down in, uh, in their architecture and we found a petabyte of data that can be moved immediately to an object storage system with the right gateways, with the right applications, okay? And they can save just the first year 300,000 euro, it could be a lot, it could be not. But, uh, yeah, and they are not going to sell object storage. They don't want to go on the market and sell an S3 repository. They don't want to fight Amazon in any way. It's just their data, emails, uh, web, uh, web, uh, web file repositories, whatever. So they are thinking about moving a lot of stuff away, get it cheap. They will add some caches on, the, on, the, on, each, on each single server to manage performance because object storage is much lower than their primary storage today, but they do manage it. Is that on-prem or is that On-prem, on-prem. Okay. Everything on-prem. <coughs> the problem with another customer, and this is a real thing, is migration. So the customer came up with this. So it's unbelievable what people can build behind the network share. So, and in fact, it's true. So he has these network shares, they are using them, and they are in the code of, uh, they developer use uh, the, <laughs> the network share directly in the code. So uh, they don't know if they change just the name of the machine, what will happen. It's a huge installation, okay? And so the, the biggest problem to do this fun is migrating data, migrating uh, to different platforms, okay? Sometimes it's, so it's really a small issue theoretically, but uh, if you go in a real world scenario, it could be devastating so from at any level. And this is a bank. Uh, it's incredible, so they have five, uh, 100 terabytes under management. It's not a huge bank. They calculated that 100 terabytes is uh, on remote offices all around. Uh, remote agencies, people uh, with uh, financial uh, promoters with uh, their iPads and so on. So instead of having uh, uh, remote storage on their sites that they have to manage, like the, any other primary storage, there is a small array in each in each uh, one of the agency with a server. And uh, so they are trying to move to sync and share everything. They say each one of the client on the remote sites will have sync and share instead of having um, a local file server. Just because it's easier. Because the user can, uh, can have the same data on the, uh, on the phone, on the, on the desktop, everywhere. It's about 100 terabytes, and of course, and then they, they think that they, they can build 
on top of that. And uh, this is the problem about analytics. Another customer, yeah, so, sounds interesting, but actually we don't know what we can move. We discover if we do it wrong, just the day after we moved something. Because we have developers all around, we have people all around, they, we know that that stuff is uh, totally cold. Actually, it's not. But we discover it the day later. And this guy has uh, 800 terabytes of Ceph. And he tried it uh, on, uh, on his skin. So he tried to move secondary data, and sometimes it's impossible. Please. Yeah, I agree. So the last generation of many object storage system, finally, they understood that they need NFS at least. Okay, most of the cases is not the best NFS of this world. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In, th in fact, the problem is finding the right uh, object storage system. So if you need a transition period, so you need to find the right product. So not all the uh, object storage system has a nice gateway, but sometimes not all the storage system has a nice gateway also for S3. They are all S3 compatible. It's just a flag. It's like, like saying we have snapshot in the primary storage. They all have snapshot. Yeah, but some of them suck. So the same thing is for object storage. You have to find the right implementation. You have to find the right gateway, so not, not that you have NFS as a gateway that you, and then you can't access data on the other side from APIs, for example. So isn't this just then uh, a larger NAS system? Like, I mean, most applications aren't really benefiting from it. Yeah, from uh, it, right, that's an application. That's an application. So you, you have to think about this system as a platform, an NFS is a protocol, object storage is another protocol. Sync and share is a protocol. Sync and share. Uh, most uh, uh, so if you want to scale, you need object on sync and share on the backend. So you need S3 APIs or you need something something else API, but you need APIs for most of them. Also for distributed NAS systems, you need probably an S3 API. There are 4,000 application and gateways today for uh, S3 compatible now. Uh, some of them are really easy to implement, some of them you want as free. So all the set of the APIs. It's not just uh, get and put, but there are many, many, many different APIs that uh, you can have or you can't. So it's not uh, that simple, but it's possible. It's a potential. So it's happening. So these four cases are happening uh, in, the, in the last month for me. They are my clients, so they are tend to move from traditional storage. They are large infrastructure. I, I can say it's good for everyone. Sometimes it's just uh, uh, because they have policies or whatever, so they can't go to Amazon S3, for example. It's just 100 terabyte. If you have less than 100 terabyte of data to move, to an object storage system, this kind of scale-out object storage system or scale-out system that proposes also object storage APIs, uh, it does not make sense, okay? Really, it does not make sense. There is, the signals are very clear, okay? So, at least for me, I know, I write a lot about object storage, so people contacted me because of object storage, okay? So probably, my observation point is uh, a little bit biased, probably mean. But, <laughs> but really, so the fact that four years ago, uh, I was talking about object storage, and, one, and most of the people said, no, object storage will never happen. And I got people with 100 terabytes, 200 terabytes moving to object storage today. So it's a very small installation. We are talking about probably three, four, five nodes, okay? Because object storage is uh, software defined. So it's, in most of the cases, is a, is a software, okay? That you install on, uh, on standard hardware uh, 
and in most of the cases are just the classic two uh, two rec units uh, servers with uh, a bunch of disks okay 12 disks uh, and you make three copies so at least three three nodes that's the easiest way to to start then there is a problem with licensing some of the object storage system don't start uh, at a very low uh, capacities but that's another problem it's a commercial problem it's not a technical problem so I finished. Thank you very much. <laughs>